Hi, I'm Peter Maruzzi, author of the new book, Greetings from Las Vegas, that features over 300 vintage photographs and postcards that tell the story of the fabulous desert oasis from its birth in 1905 to the swinging 60s and beyond. The Nevada Preservation Foundation invited me to prepare this short video of highlights from the full 40-minute slide talk that I'll be giving in September as part of NPF's Home and History Weekend. The inspiration for the book was my enormous collection of Las Vegas ephemera, postcards, matchbooks, menus, brochures, photos, and other promotional materials that I've been collecting since the mid-1980s. Back then, I scoured flea markets, antique malls, and especially postcard shows. Of course, eBay has made collecting infinitely easier, but I really do miss the treasure hunt of the old days. This is Fremont Street looking west, circa 1910, with the railroad depot at the end. Las Vegas was a sleepy western frontier town. Then, in 1929, the Great Depression hit. In response, there were two events that would radically change the trajectory of Las Vegas. The construction of Boulder Dam between 1931 and 1936, and the legalization of gambling by the Nevada legislature in 1931. The early Fremont Street Clubs were small. But soon, operators with experience running illegal gambling operations arrived from the Midwest, East, and South. In 1941, the Western-themed El Rancho opened just outside the Las Vegas city limits on Highway 91, the main road from Los Angeles. In unincorporated Clark County, there was plenty of cheap land on both sides of what would soon become known as the Las Vegas Strip. The El Rancho was seen from the highway. It had a hotel, showroom, casino, and swimming pool. At the new hotel Last Frontier, just down the highway, Yellowstone's Old Faithful Inn was the inspiration for its pioneer lobby in 1942. After World War II, the Flamingo would change everything. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel and his associates took over the unfinished Flamingo project from a financially strapped Billy Wilkerson in 1945. Wilkerson was the owner of the Hollywood Reporter and the famous Trocadero and Ciro's nightclubs on the Sunset Strip. The Flamingo would be patterned after those very Sunset Strip nightclubs frequented by Siegel and his Hollywood pals, sleek and modern. The 1950s boom of the Las Vegas Strip was astounding in the number of hotels that opened, sometimes two in one year. The charming and dapper Wilbur Clark, seen here on the right, began construction on his desert inn in 1950. But, like Wilkerson, he too soon ran out of money. To Clark's rescue came Morris Moe Dalitz on the left and his underworld pals from Ohio. It was Dalitz's first investment in Las Vegas. The Desert Inn, with Clark as front man, opened in 1950 in the refined Western Ranch style. It was designed by Las Vegas architect Hugh Taylor. Note the glass-walled sky room near the big sign. Arriving in style at the 1952 Sahara. Also in 1952, The Sands debuted. It was a late modern masterpiece by Los Angeles architect Wayne McAllister. This young woman was so mesmerized by the new Sands that she had to sketch the sign while sitting on the lawn next to the highway. Suddenly, a Miami Beach hotel was dropped into the desert. The 1955 Riviera was the first high-rise on the Strip. This is among my favorite amateur Kodachromes in my collection. It's of the 1955 Dunes. Wow! Who came up with this concept for the Dunes promo brochure? I've got an idea. We'll have this babe in a bikini Drink pool water from a giant seahorse. That'll make a great cover. Tony Carnero was one of the great characters of Las Vegas. Opened in 1958, the Stardust had the biggest, most spectacular neon sign on the Strip. In fact, the building was the sign, and vice versa. Unfortunately, Tony Carnero never saw his fabulous Stardust, having died three years earlier while playing craps at the Desert Inn. It would be Mo Dalitz who saw the Stardust project to completion. The Stardust was a huge hotel with rows of motel rooms at the back resembling boxcars. Notice in the center of this uh, image, 
the Aku Aku Polynesian Restaurant. The gambling business has always attracted a colorful collection of characters. In the early decades, many arrived with shady backgrounds linked to bootlegging, bookmaking, and illegal backroom wagering. When the Nevada legislature legalized gambling in 1931, an opportunity for experienced gaming operators and a chance to go legit suddenly emerged. The 1950s boom of the Las Vegas Strip was assisted by the active involvement of mob-connected newcomers of varying degrees of notoriety. In the ensuing decades, some of these fellows became leading businessmen and philanthropists who helped build the modern Las Vegas. Here we see Riviera investors Ice Pick Willie Alderman, Dave Berman, and Joe Bowser Rosenberg. If you ever saw the Scorsese movie Casino, you'll remember the Joe Pesci character Tony the Ant Spilotro. Here's the real Tony on the left with the mob lawyer who played himself in the movie, Oscar Goodman. Of course, Goodman would one day become the city's popular mayor, most closely associated with the slogan, What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. After World War II, Fremont Street still pushed the Old West theme, naming itself Glitter Gulch in 1946. The Chamber of Commerce introduced Vegas Vic in 1947. He appeared in ads and brochures throughout the 1950s. However, his greatest incarnation was as the 50-foot mascot for the Pioneer Club, where he appeared in 1951. Yesco, the young electric sign company, was a designer with their final sketch on the left. After Benny Binion returned from a stint in Texas State Prison, he embarked on a spectacular physical makeover of the Horseshoe in 1961. He cocooned the Apache Hotel in a cascade of aqua blue and white neon. For years, the Nevada Club had a roving photographer prowling the slot machines taking pictures for souvenir postcards of happy gamblers. Here's Fred and Madge in 1957. People come to Las Vegas to gamble, but also to be entertained. In the 1950s, it was the exceptional talents of impresarios such as the Sands' Jack and Trotter and Bill Miller of the Sahara who set Las Vegas on the path to becoming the entertainment capital of the world. And Trotter brought America's top performers to the Sands' Copa Room. One of the most recognizable icons of the era was the beautiful Vegas showgirl. With her bejeweled costumes, fantastically towering headpieces, and elaborately choreographed dance routines. Careful! Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, and Joy Bishop were the core of the Rat Pack. Cracking each other up until the wee small hours of the morning. Even after the group went its separate ways, Las Vegas in the early 60s would forever be known as the Rat Pack era. Almost all of the architects working in Las Vegas after World War II were fluent in modernism. When given the chance, they would produce buildings of rigor, refinement, and beauty. The 1952 Sahara was influenced by the low-slung ranch modern houses popular in Southern California. Wayne McAllister's Sands, also of 1952, was a late modern sculptural tour de force. In Las Vegas's post-war residential neighborhoods, some of the new track developments were as modern in design as the resorts being built on the Strip. William Kreisel of Palm Springs fame was the design architect behind the Paradise Palms tract surrounding the Stardust Golf Club. In my opinion, the most ultra-modern hotel ever erected in the desert was the 1964 tower called the Diamond of the Dunes by Chicago-based architect Milton M. Schwartz. It also had one of the greatest neon signs of all time. At Caesar's Palace, we see the classical architecture of Imperial Rome reinterpreted in the style of new formalism. Renowned African-American architect Paul R. Williams designed the neo-expressionist La Concha Motel in 1961. Its relocated lobby now houses the wonderful Neon Museum. The 1960s saw the completion of Caesar's Palace, Circus Circus, The Landmark, and high-rise expansions of the Sahara, Dunes, Flamingo, and Sands. 
Here's Miss Buttercup and her water skiing friends and their red Thunderbird at the Thunderbird. Very clever. The New International was the site of Elvis Presley's triumphant 1969 return to Las Vegas, inaugurating a new phase of his career. In the 1970s, it was Benny Binion's World Series of Poker at his horseshoe that would grow into a massive phenomenon. And here we are in the 1980s. What more can be said? In conclusion, I look forward to seeing you during the Nevada Preservation Foundation's Home and History Weekend in September when I'll be giving the complete 40-minute slide presentation that is chock full of additional eye candy. In the meantime, you can buy a copy of Greetings from Las Vegas at Amazon for less than the $30 cover price. Thank you for watching and Viva Las Vegas!